All right, I am recording. There's nobody on right now, and if anybody does jump on, I'll quick let them in. But today is Thursday, the 16th of February, and as it says in the email I sent out just a few minutes ago, we're going to finish up Chapter 13 today on forms, jump right into Chapter 14, spend just a little bit of time because it's a very, very short chapter on audio and video. And then finally, we'll end up with CSS transitions, transforms, etc. All right, good morning, Grant. And as I said, um, we're going to finish up chapter 13 right now on forms, jump in and very quickly go over chapter 14, um, and then finally chapter 15. Okay, I'm I'm trying to come up with, and I will this weekend, come up with some kind of a pretest and some kind of a test. I'm not sure yet what it'll be. Okay, but uh, you'll know that by Monday. How's that? Uh, tomorrow will be our typical lab day, so again, no taping will be done. Please remember, we have now gone over the uh, shape up for Chapter 10, but you still have to finish that, turn that in, along with the Halloween Superstore for Chapter 10 and the written test for Chapter 10. Those are due by Sunday at midnight. And I believe I've mentioned this before, but just in case I have not, um, the way that you are marked as far as being present or absent is, did you turn in anything? So if you just turn in the written test, even if you turn in nothing else, you'll be marked as present for the past week. All right. In addition, the chapters 11 through 15, written tests, labs, and homework will be due a week from Sunday. So with that said, what we did yesterday, and I did put this out there on the system, I cleaned this up a little bit, and right now this is pretty much, this is what the form looks like. All right, it's not perfect by any means. I added a few things, moved some stuff around. I found out that, you know, this was really perplexing for lack of better words. But um, <clears throat> if you notice here for desired shift, I've got a, a, a colon at the end. And for gender, I had a colon at the end and it didn't work. So really, I'm going to probably remove that colon that's there. But um, I wanted to mention a few things that I've done first. All right. And in taking a look at this, one thing I did was I went in and I tried to make pretty much the drop down here be the same size as the other things. It looks like it's a little thicker, but it's pretty much the same size. All right. I added hints or placeholders for everything. And I did, I did not reset this or I set it to a default of Missouri as opposed to saying select a state. All right. Most of the other stuff I believe we went over yesterday, but what I did want to do, and I and when I say this, I truly mean it, and that is quickly make sure that I didn't skip anything yesterday because one of the things you are going to be expected to do on your next test, which will be the last test on this book. All right, so one of the things you will be expected to do um, is to create a form and to understand the components of a form. All right, so again, that's what we did yesterday. We created the form, and when we did, I talked about IDs, and I even mentioned IDs and the name property. All right, and we talked about the form itself. You can give the form an ID. We talked about actions. We talked about methods. We Everything that's in here, we basically talked about. In lieu of building a simple form as the author did in here, I built my own. I believe I mentioned this yesterday, but again, something like this that you see right here in gray, that is no, everything from the question mark on over is known as a query string. So it's saying that we sent an email up to Zach at modulemedia.com, all right? And that basically we click the subscribe button. All right, forms are made up of controls, as they mentioned right there. With the buttons, they talked about the different types of buttons in here. What I did was I showed you a submit button. I showed you a reset button. Uh, I showed you just a button itself where the type is equal to button. All right. And 
what I didn't do was to show you, for example, the button that's in there that's uh, got an image in it. So you can see in here what they've done is they've got both text and an image. All right. And I think I even mentioned yesterday, I don't think you see that that much anymore. For instance, you know, when you see a picture of a house, as crude as it may be, most people think of home. And when you see the shopping cart there, you think of a card. So a lot of times today, you won't even see any text on there. You'll just see the pictures or images. All right, we talked a little bit about text fields and text areas. All right, we went over the type. All right, and I showed you examples of text, of password, and of hidden. We talked about value. All right, I didn't get into max length, but one thing that you can do, now notice what it says, because this is something that confuses people at least at times. Max length isn't how big this is. No, max length is just what's the maximum number of characters you can enter into that field. So even though I didn't do it, on mine, for example, if I have a zip code field, I might want to make the maximum number of characters 10. All right. And why? Because five characters, a dash and four more of an idea. All right. <clears throat> the autofocus is typically what you do is and we set that yesterday to be our first name field so that when the form first comes up, that that is where the cursor is. We went over placeholders. All right. Uh, we looked at examples of radio buttons. We looked at examples of check boxes. We looked at examples of labels. So we talked about all these. It used to be for check. You, you, up until a few years ago, you had to say checked equals checked, which I always thought was kind of silly. All right. But now you only have to put in the word checked. OK, what you'll find and the reason this is important is not so much for somebody like Grant, who's already had the uh, uh, the C sharp class, but for the rest of you who will be taking the C sharp class this summer, is many of the properties that uh, that you have for a radio button will be the same for a checkbox. Of course, some will be different because they're different controls. And remember that with radio buttons, you typically set them up in a group or you give them the same name like we did here so that only one can be active at a time as opposed to check boxes where zero, one, two, up to all of them can be checked at the same time. But you'll find, like I said, many of the properties programmatically between these two are going to be the same. They did a pretty good example here and it's kind of a tried and true classic example. I mean, you can you can go out and in Google and find entire forms that's just from a pizza company. All right, okay. The drop down list and the list boxes, I did a drop down list for you where we put the states in as opposed to what they have right here. All right, for the list box, again, the difference is it's for, typically it's for a very small number of choices. You've got to realize that when you are talking about a, a screen, you know, especially a screen like a mobile screen, but even when a laptop or a desktop, you only have so much real estate. So you don't find a lot of list boxes on forms. I'm not gonna say you never do, but I don't think you find many. All right, from there we went on and I talked about the number field. And I mentioned like if you said salary and you made that type equal number, it would only accept numbers and you can set minimums and maximums in there, all right? And what's going to happen when you create a number field, what you're going to see is something like this. You're going to get the up and down arrows. And here they set the step value to be 100. So this says 300. If you click the up arrow, it would go to 400. If you click the down arrow, it would go to 200, et cetera. All right. And we talked about the tell, the telephone. I showed you that very quickly. Date and time, again, if you are setting up some kind of an application <clears throat> where you are, you know, I mentioned yesterday, maybe setting up a form for a doctor's office, or if for some reason you wanted to, a, a person to have to put in the, the uh, day, a month, and year that they were born, and you wanted to have a little more control, you could use something like this. All right. 
Then from there, we went on to other skills for working with forms. We talked about aligning controls. All right, I mentioned the autofocus already. They did a label float equal left, which I went back and did it the same way. That's fine. All right, but there are other ways that you can do it as well. Grouping controls. All right. Um, we talked about the field set. We talked about the legend yesterday. So again, this is the field set, and that is the box around. Uh, technically, there's two field sets in here, the one for here and the one for here. And the legend for this one is crust, and the legend for this one is toppings. And all it does is it allows you, as it says there, to group your controls. All right, so how to set the tab order and assign access keys. There are still a lot of people who are used to, you know, they're, most of them are older people like me, and they're used to perusing their way around a keyboard by hitting a tab key. They're just used to doing that. Now, what you'll find, and I think I showed you this yesterday, that if I bring up the form that we were working with yesterday, and I reload, all right, not sure why it's doing that, sure. All right, and I, I, you know, I'm in here. When I start to come in and hit tab, it pretty much is setting up whoop, everything the way I want, all right? And that's because of the order in which I put in all of the elements in here. Now, what you'll find when you do this is very similar to what we worked on last semester in the AWD 1100 C sharp class. <clears throat> Anything that you put in here that's a label, they, that cannot get the focus. All right. The reason that you get the focus is because you're, you're able to, to come in and, and type something, meaning that you can add something, remove something, or modify something. You can't do that to a label while the program is running. You're just not allowed to do that. One thing you may notice when you take a quick look on here is you'll notice I've got this. All right. So for instance, if I come in here and I put in Jeff, all right, Scott, et cetera, and I keep doing all this stuff, you know, this the reason that this is working like this, the reason that it works is that I have the autocomplete is set up in here. All right. And if you know some people like to have an autocomplete turned on, some people like to have an autocomplete turned off. Again, it's a matter of preference. But one of the things that they mention in this next section here, after tab orders, they'll talk about autocomplete. So you can manually come in and set a tab order. All right. You can also set access keys for years. It's changed a little bit now. But for years, when you were working in any kind of Microsoft software and you wanted to exit, all right, you would do either a control X or an alt X to exit. All right, one of the things that we learned last semester in the C sharp class was when we were creating forms in there and we had fields, be it like a button or something else, and we wanted to be able to, let's say we had a button called calculate. All right, we could set it up with an access key. Usually it's the first letter, it doesn't have to be, but for like calculate, we could set it in, in what would show when you would run the program was there'd be an underscore or an underline under the letter C in calculate. So if you would do an alt C or a control C, it would do the calculate for you. You can do the same thing in here. Some people like that and they're used to working with things like that. Again, you'll see how you get the underscore here. All right. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. And it's it's all again, it's a matter of taste, to be honest with you. All right. Now to put these underscores here for first name, last name, and email, they're manually sticking in the letter U. All right, which is for underline. Now it says they're setting a proper tab order and providing access keys improves the accessibility for users who can't use a mouse. And that is true. All right, you have people that for whatever reason, they're not dexterous, they're older. It could be a lot of different things. 
So I don't mean at all to downplay doing this. I will tell you for your Joe or Jane average user, they could probably care less. All right, but you know, to try to make things as easy as possible for anyone who might be using your form, you, you very well might want to come in and set both a tab order and uh, and access keys. So the tab order, it says there, it's the sequence in which the controls receive the focus when the tab order is pressed. By default, and I already showed you that, it's the order of the controls in the HTML and not the labels. All right, access keys again are just shortcut keys. All right. <clears throat> now, the next thing that's in there is validation. So we're going to add a little bit more validation. We actually put some in yesterday. When you think about it, what we did was we added the word required to each field. All right, and that's validation. You have to put something in there or you get an error message. All right. Now, I may have mentioned this yesterday, but I want to say it again today. The way that this stuff works is, you know, typically a lot of the validation that you put into a form typically will be done using JavaScript, which we haven't discussed yet. But if you get a, a user, a savvy user, or somebody who maybe doesn't care, it is possible to disable JavaScript on your machine. You say, well, why would you ever want to do that? You typically wouldn't, but you can do it if you choose to. The reason I'm telling you this is normally what happens is you run a whole bunch of data validations on your HTML form. You want to make sure that, for instance, if you're asking somebody to register for something, you want their first name, you want their last name, you want their email address. Th things like that would be mandatory. OK, now, if, if somebody is uh, going out, let's say, to Amazon and they're ordering something, of course, there'll be more stuff than that they'll need. All right. You know, and, and you may have to fill out some stuff. And after you fill it out once, Amazon may keep track of that, et cetera. But I will tell you, um, I had some suspicious activity, just, you know, we'll put, we'll leave it like that on, on uh, one of my credit cards. All right, so I contacted the company and they said, all we can do is deny this charge and we have to give you a new card. Okay, fine, they had to give me a new card. But then what happened was some of the stuff that I pay for automatically each month using my credit card, it was denied them because they tried using that card, which wasn't there anymore. All right. So I had to contact those companies all right, myself and go in. Some of them I could do online. Some of them I had to call for that. That's all data validation. So what happens is you run a whole bunch of data validation on the client side. If that passes when you click the submit button, it goes to a server. And guess what? Virtually the same exact or very close to it, data validation things are run on the server, even though you just ran them on the client. The reason for that is, as I mentioned, it's possible to disable JavaScript. And it's, you know, sometimes people try to do things they aren't supposed to do. And almost always, this data that you're entering into a form will end up into a database someplace. You wanna make sure that before the data goes into the database, it has been completely validated. Now, what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna create a form and have absolutely zero validation on that form, nothing. Nothing is required. You don't check anything. And the reason that you don't want to do that is let's suppose that you had no validation. Now somebody you know turns in a form and it's and they've they've done it in kind of a half-assed manner in that some stuff isn't filled in, some stuff is wrong, etc. Then what happens is it'll fail those tests that get run on the server and it'll be sent right back to the client. So rather than waste the server's time, you should always validate on the client first. 
even though knowing that it's going to be validated again later on the server. All right, some additional things. There is this autocomplete feature, all right, that they talk about in here. So let's look at this. Okay, it says set this attribute to off to tell the browser to disable autocomplete. Some people find it very irritating when they're filling out stuff, all right, to have that on. But I would argue that while you're testing, it's a nice tool to have, all right? And what I mean is if, if I'm testing, you know, all my, my stuff that I put into my form for my validation, it's nice when I can click a button or two and, and you know, select an item or two and have things filled in for me. But most people will find that what they will do is they will set it to off, all right, when they're all finished and they've finished testing. The required field we already looked at. I don't think there's anything more to say about that. Now, the no validate, it says this Boolean attribute tells the browser it shouldn't validate the controls on the form that it is coded for. All right, I don't know why you would do that, but again, there probably is a very valid reason. And the form no validate, it says this tells the browser that it shouldn't validate the controls on the form when the submit button that is coded for is used to submit the form. All right, again, these are things that are available and I'm not saying you would or would not ever use them. All right, now what they have in here, I did not use this, but we could have. Notice that right underneath the picture that you see on your screen, they talk about the CSS pseudo classes for required, valid, and invalid fields. All right, so what we have got right now is if you leave something blank and you click it, all right, it just comes back with a message on the first field because they're all required that says something like fill out this field or please fill out this field. But what you can do are things like this, and the example we'll look at in just a couple minutes does a really good job of, of explaining this in more detail. All right, so. It says by default autocomplete feature is on on most browsers. So again, you have to manually turn it off. This, so if we changed the color and made it red, that would say that any field that's required that we didn't fill in after sit, after uh, clicking the button would turn red. All right, we can also check for things that are valid and things that are invalid. Some people like to do this. For instance, they could make checks on any valid field and make this the background on this turn green. Whereas they could take the, the uh, background or the, the border, I should say, for any invalid field and make it red. So there's all sorts of things you can do, ways that you can set this up if you want to do that. All right, okay. Next, they're gonna talk just a little bit here about regular expressions. And regular expressions are also known as regex, R-E-G-E-X. I'm going to show you a site that's, you know, it's it's a pretty ugly site. What is it? It's regular expressions.io, I believe. Let's see. No, that isn't it. Is it regex.io? No, that isn't the one I want to show you either. All right. We'll find it. Well, I don't want to waste your time. I'll look for it during the break, but it's a very ugly site. But what it does is it, it's got links on there for most of the programming languages, including JavaScript, C Sharp, et cetera. I'll find that during the break. All right. Now, I mentioned yesterday, one of the things that we looked at was this HTML5 pattern.com. Pattern or patterns. I don't remember. There it is. So there ex are examples in here of regular expressions. Now, the one I showed you yesterday was this one. This is pretty ugly. So notice the format that's in here. This is an international 
more an international format. All right. I don't like that one, so I'm going to write my own in just a minute to show you. But before we do that, let's go and bring up. I don't have it up right now. But let's bring up the form that we had from yesterday. There we go. And I will quickly show you the CSS that I added yesterday. All right, I gave it the, the whole body a background color. Didn't have to do that. I changed the H1 to an H2. It, to me, it was a little bit too big. The form we had set up yesterday, so there really is nothing new in there. All right, the input. So these are the, you know, basically any kind of an input, any select statement and any button. All I did was set border and, and margin so they weren't pushed up against each other. That's how they were looking yesterday. And I put that box sizing border box. I could have actually put that up here just as well. Doesn't really matter. Set my loaded left. They have a certain width. All right, text align right. Set the field set. All right, and the field set, as you can see, put a little margin bottom on there. All right, set the width and centered it on the screen. And then finally, these were for the states because as I mentioned to you, I wanted the state to be about the same size, um, the state box as those labels. All right. Now, when we come back into here and we take a look at what's in here, okay, there's not really a lot that you can do as far as coming in here and doing validation on a first name, on a last name, etc. Some people have you know, I shouldn't say weird. I was going to say that, but that's not fair. If you're from another country, maybe you've seen this where they have like two dots above their name, or if it's Spanish, they might have a tilde over something. So to say that everything that's in there has to be, all right, for a first name, for example, that to say that everything has to be letters, you could do that. But what about somebody who has maybe a first name that is two words? and it's either hyphenated or there's a blank in between there. So there's so many different possibilities. Last names are even worse. All right, again, with like people like O'Hara, where you've got a, a uh, an apostrophe in there. So that's very hard to work with. Addresses. Most of us would say, well, what could you have in an address? You can have numbers, you could have letters, and you could have a blank space. But again, it, the same kind of thing arises here. What about hyphens, et cetera, things like that. City, same kind of thing. Really, when you think about it, we actually right now, the, the probably the best thing that we have in here, probably the best thing that we have in here as far as validation is the state. Because they, you know, really something in there by default, we have we have selected Missouri. We don't have to do that. All right. So again, I put that in here. You'll see it. It says selected. And if we remove that, what's going to come up then when we run this is it'll say select the state. So this will now be what comes up. All right. And we talked about this yesterday that this is what shows on the screen but the value is what you probably would end up pushing out to a database or something like that. Now, you would have to programmatically go in and check right now to see if it says select the state because then you know they didn't select one, all right? All right, then going on, email. Again, I already mentioned this to you yesterday, but I just wanted to show this to you that if I go in here and I type in, for example, um, email regex expression, something like that. Because some of these are really, really, really long. All right. So here's an example. All right. And I don't, that's actually a very short one. And I'm not sure if that one would work or not, but there's, you know, they will come in here. And some of these, like I said, that you'll see, there's a different one. 
All right, and it says, any thoughts on making this shorter? All right, and yeah, people will come up with different things. All right, but when you think of all the different possibilities, you know, back in the day when you first had emails, as an example, there were only a few extensions at the end. A .edu, a .net, a .com, a .org, and there weren't many more other than those. Now there are literally hundreds of them. You can have country codes in there. There's like a .tv, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff. All right, let's try to put a pattern in here. And I think it's just pattern equal. We'll find out if I'm wrong. So I'm gonna say in here pattern equal, and I'm gonna put it in and I'll explain everything after I put it in. All right. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's see. And this may be wrong. It's been a while since I've written a pattern, but I think it's correct. And if it's not, we'll figure out what it is. All right. Oh, and I want a dollar sign at the end. All right. So what does all this mean? To start with, the caret that you see means start with. The dollar sign that you see there means ends with. In this case, it's not mandatory that you put either one of those in there. The D3 means I want three digits, then the hyphen, then three more digits, and that should not be parens in there. That should be another set of curlies. there and get rid of this stuff. All right, sorry about that. And then another hyphen and four digits. All right, again, that's a fairly simple pattern. I may have written it incorrectly. Something tells me I did, but let's see. So let's just do a save and then let's come back and write, the, write and run this. All right. So let's see, that's everything. So looking on here now, everything as far as I can tell, let's just check all these, but for the phone number, this is in the wrong, notice it says right there, if I put my mouse over it, it says, please match the requested format. So let's see if I submit, and that's what it says. So it's expecting it to be in this type of format right here. And that's my home phone number, but 314-286-3 uh, dash dash All right. And now if I press submit, oh, it's still saying please match the requested format. So I may have done it wrong. So let's look. OK, I'll show you. Well, first of all, we can look at another way you can do this. All right. You can come in here and you can say. Zero through nine, which means that it'll take the digits from zero to nine, three of them, and then we could do it here. Like that, and then we could do it here. All right, so. Three digits, three digits, three digits. Some people will say don't put a zero there because you could never start a phone number with zero. That isn't true in all countries. And this would be more for a thing in America. So we go back here. Let's go back here and take a look at that. And see if now. All right, so I'm leaving that off on here now. OK, and let's just put in a something. All right, please match the requested format and let's put a dash in here and a dash in there. And it is still saying please match the requested format. All right.
you can see how ugly some of these get. All right. Now there matches three numbers. The last one is set up to match four, etc. That hope that helps. This should match everything in your group. Well, what does this mean? Ugly. Mandatory. So in other words, this is trying to match putting in parentheses, area code, space, three numbers, dash, four numbers. So there's so many different ways that you can set this thing up. All right. And you see, so it wouldn't handle this because there's no dashes and there's a space there. Wouldn't handle this. There's a beginning print. You can run through all of them. All right. So there's a lot of ways that you can set this up. Now with the D, maybe that was it. Maybe it was a slash D. I always forget on these things. I should do it more often than I do. But a slash D. I'm going to try that. Like this. All right, we're going to see if that works. And if it doesn't, I'm just going to go on. All right. So we'll do this one. And it took it. OK, so that pattern worked. All right, the slash D said three digits, followed by a hyphen, followed by three more digits, followed by a hyphen, followed by four more digits. Now, one thing about that, just so you know, what that means is. If I come in and put this in the way a lot of people like to, which is like this. It will not take it. Oops. It should be a paren. It will not take this. It's going to come up and give me an error because that's not the requested format. All right, but as soon as you put it, put that in, somebody's going to say, well, geez, I don't want to really put that. I want it to take it like that, etc." And a lot of times you'll see that you basically are going to force the person to put it in in one kind of format. That'll also help later if you're putting it into, the, into a database because everything is going to be put in in the same way. All right, sorry about that. I didn't mean to go on and on about that. So they do talk a little bit about regular expressions and here they give, I guess I could have looked here too. All right, so they show passwords, zip codes, phone numbers, etc. Dates are another big one, you know, um, sometimes you force the user to put in the month and the day in two digits, regardless of whether it's greater than 10 or less than 10. All right. And there's a URL thing in here. There's credit cards. There's a lot of different things. All right. And I want to, like I said, I want to find that site during the break. Hopefully it's, I haven't looked at it for a year, so hopefully it's still an active site. All right. So they end the chapter by going over this web page with a form on here. So you can see what they put here. All right, a few, well, you'll notice that they have this set up with four different field sets. All right, and on those field sets, what do they have here? All right, they've got the legends in red, no biggie. And you can see when you leave something off from there that is required, all right, you can see that it comes back in red. All right, you can also see that for the password with nothing in there, for the state with nothing in there, for the zip code, et cetera, there, there, is, uh, there, there are placeholders in there, okay? Again, I'm to the point where I don't even expect the person to have to put in their state code. All right, that I do what I showed you, and that is just basically bring it in with the select and an option and have people do it like that. All right, so they show you the HTML for this, and let's just very quickly go over the stuff in mustard yellow there because that's the new stuff. Again, you'll notice for the email, the type is email, whereas underneath that for the password, the type is password. 
most of the other things that you'd put in there, the type would be in would just be text. All right, the autofocus, meaning that'll be the first field again that's got the the focus when you start or it's the one highlighted, whatever you want to say. You notice that several fields are required. And you'll also notice, because I didn't show you this, that when you set up a pattern, all right, you can put your own message in there if you want. So for instance, when I set my pattern up, okay, we could have said must be in this kind of format. I don't want to waste your time watching me type that. But you know, for the phone number, we could have put in the pattern. Then underneath that, we could have put in a title that said must be in this format, n n n hyphen n n n hyphen n n n n, where each n is a number, something like that. All right, you want to try to always make sure you never want to insult people when they fill out something wrong, but you also want to provide help for them when they do something incorrectly. You probably have seen things like this before. All right, I know a lot of times when I set up passwords for different things, they have to be a minimum of eight characters. There has to be a lowercase letter in there. There has to be an uppercase letter in there, be a number in there, and quite often even some kind of a special character, an asterisk or a comma or whatever. Now, this is a fairly complex form but there really shouldn't be anything in there. In fact, there's where they put the title, okay? And they've also got a date in here, so a date field that they set up, and there's other things that you can set up as well. I mean, you can make unbelievably complex forms, and there are a lot of them out there. There also, and I should say this, there also are, uh, there, there's software out there that'll basically generate forms for you. It's interesting, you know, I don't know how many of you have looked up, I think it's chat BT, um, but there is so much stuff that's coming down the pike, you know, and, and you got to look at it. I was, I watched this, um, I watched a video the other day where the guy asked, he said, is AI going to kill programming? All right, because you, you know, you'll be able to talk to your computer and have it write some code and do some stuff for you. And he said, well, you, you know, you got to look at it that, it's not that it's going to kill programming, all right, that maybe it'll help programming, all right, but again, it's, it's you know, like when you've got, for example, like a Tesla or, or a vehicle where, where a lot of things are automated and it's, it's made really well, et cetera, things are still going to break down. Somebody has to be able to go in and fix those. Somebody has to be able to go in and if you get something created for you, you know, whether it's an AI tool or whatever, that somebody, you know, if people want it modified, you'll still have to be able to go in and do that. So at least that's my hope. And here was the CSS. Again, there's the field set and the legend. This is that required stuff. All right. So in other words, you've got a black, solid black border around anything that worked, anything that didn't work, that if it was required and you left it off, you now got a red border around it. All right. If something was invalid, you're removing the box shadow, et cetera. So you can see all that stuff that's in there. All right, there are a few other controls. And as it says, the chat with six more controls that are useful for some websites. You oftentimes see things like this, like a search control that you can set up. All right, I mean, a lot of people, my, my wife loves Facebook and you know, always is using the search out there to search for this person or that person or whatever. And you can set it up that you can do a search where you can tell it where to search. You can search within a site. You can have it basically do the equivalent of a Google search. All right, etc. All right. When we get in and we're talking about uh, Bootstrap in a week or so, all right, we'll talk more about searching. The file upload allows you to do that. As it says, it allows you to upload one or more files to a web server. Now, even with that, OK, there's things that are involved in that. I mean, if you're going to give people the ability to upload things, you know, you would have to have some kind of mechanism in there to make sure that what they upload um, 
isn't corrupted or it doesn't have a virus in it or whatever. All right, but they show some of this stuff in here and here is where it comes in and it'll accept images, etc. All right, so I mean, why would you do something like this? Well, what if what if you were setting up for some reason you set up a website where people could post their favorite vacation image of all time, something like that. You could do this, but again, you'd have to have, there'd have to be some security in there to make sure that people weren't uploading things that they shouldn't be uploading. All right, the color, range, progress, and meter. The color picker does just that. It brings up a color picker. So notice what you have in here. All right, it says choose your background or your background color. You can do whatever you wanted to do with it. All right, and it'll bring up this color picker right here. And when you're doing this color picker, what does it have? Well, you can set it up by using the wheel here. Really, this is a meter control, or these are the red, green, blue values. Remember, zero to 255. All right, this is a, a straight here range control. All right. As it says, you could use it for rating, and there's a little slider on there. The progress and the meter, you might use one of those if you had a website where you were trying to, I don't know, you were trying to raise money for somebody, or you know, you, you basically set up some kind of a, a, a GoFundMe type of thing to let people know where you were. All right, so again, those could be used. Now, whatever you get for a test next week, I'm not going to pull in search. I'm not going to pull in progress and meter, et cetera. It'll be the basic, you know, if you have to build a form, it'll be building a basic form, something very similar to what I built for you in this chapter. All right. Finally, there's a data list and an output control. The data list is kind of cool because what you can do, it's kind of a helper. So in other words, here it says, what is your preferred search engine? And you have a drop down. And you could have a bunch of them listed here. All right. Also, typically, the way these data lists work is there's some smarts built into them. So, in other words, if you type in a G for Google, all right, it'll come up and it'll show you here these two. Or if here you typed in an, an O, you'd get Google and Yahoo because they both have O's in them, as an example. All right. Now, this output control in here, all right. I'm not even going to talk about it because once we get into where we are using JavaScript, this will become moot. You probably would never do it like this. All right. And that's it for the chapter. So I'm going to go on um, to the next chapter. We can probably actually get through this chapter before the break. It's that short a chapter. All right. Any questions that you have on chapter 13? Not right now, no. <laughs> Let's jump in right into chapter 14, which again is on um, audio and video. All right, so you can see it starts on 464 and it ends on 472. It's not even 10 pages. This is an introduction, and I will tell you that what has happened over time is most audio and video software has gotten smarter. What I mean is, and they'll even say this in the chapter, if for some reason you've got something in some kind of a weird audio or a weird video format and you attempt to bring it up or you attempt to save it, you'll have the ability for audio to save it as an MP3. And for video, you'll have the ability to save it as an MP4. All of these lectures that I do that I put out on my YouTube channel get saved as MP4 files. Now, maybe maybe you're maybe you some of you listen to podcasts, which typically, you know, just are all uh, audio and they're put in as MP3 files. So they will talk about the common media types. There are free conversion kits that are out there. All right. The other day I showed you when we went, maybe it was yesterday when we had an automatic favicon generator. All right, there's 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 auto things up on the web that if for some reason you wanted all of your files saved as ping files, PNG files, but you had some that were um, JPEGs, JPG files or JPEG files, 
there are converters out there that will convert them for you for free. In the same way, there are media converters as well. All right. And finally, they'll end up by showing you a very a, a small little page with audio and video in it. Now, the one thing about this is if I wanted to put in something really simple, like for instance, if I wanted to put in a sound clip, I can literally just bring that in to a web page and put a hyperlink in there, you know, and 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 put in, you know, like um the sound of a baby crying and I could put the baby crying. I could have that part underlined. And when you click on it, you know, you could go out and find. I'm sure that there's someplace out on the web. Right. You can do a similar type of thing with video or and I may have shown you this before. I may not have. I really don't remember. All right. But if I go out here. And I go out to YouTube. All right, and let's say under out here under YouTube, I want this thing from Stephen Colbert yesterday. All right, I find this commercial funny. This is just me because this guy looks like George Santos to me. All right, so I've got this, but if I go out here and where is it? Uh, if I go to share, okay, and I go to embed, I can grab all of this code right here, every single bit of this, all right? Probably there's a copy in there too, but this will work fine. And I'm just gonna copy it to the clipboard. That's all I'm gonna do right here. And then I'm going to come over and I'll come in here. I don't, I, I'll just create a garbage little file right here. So, um, and if I paste that in, all right, and I save this. And I open it in live server. Well, somehow it didn't copyright, but the point is it'll come up. It will. All right. Now, what don't I have in here? There's something I don't have that I should have. All right. Allow full screen, et cetera, et cetera. But it is that easy. Now, why isn't it working? I don't know. I'm looking here and I can tell already by looking at it, this is blue. Notice how it changes somewhere in here. There's a, a something screwed up with the curly braid with the uh, double quotes rather. But the point is, that's all you have to do. Right, literally, and I think the problem is I put it up here. So let's grab this again. This iframe. Right, and in fact, let's just do this. OK. And let's make sure we're in here. OK, I'm going to do it all over again. So. All right, now in my body because I was in here, so right there. Paste it in. Save. And run it. That's it. And it'll play. All right. You can set it up so it'll play full screen, etc. That's literally all you have to do. So I always tell people if they want to embed something in there. Now, the same kind of rules that are going to apply here that when we talked about grabbing images, all right, you know, you, you may or may not be able to. This may be public domain. And if it is, yeah, you can go in and just add it if you want to. But you should always check first. That's why uh, a company of any size has got a legal department to see whether or not you can do something like that. All right. So it says when most of us think of media types, we think of MP3. All right. And that's probably most, most of it. So you think of MP3 for audio, MP4 for video, but there are other ones. All right. And the main reason that there are other ones, just so you know, there has never, to my knowledge, been universal agreement among all browsers that we will use this format. Now, to my knowledge, all browsers support MP3 and MP4 files, all right, without any kind of problems. A few years ago, they came up with this OG, and you'll notice there's an OG in there for both uh, audio and video, and that was going to be the thing that everybody agreed on until not everybody agreed on it. 
Then they came up with WebM and notice what it says, supported by all modern browsers except Safari. Well, Safari is the built-in browser you get with an iPhone, an iPad, you know, a MacBook, et cetera. So really, you know, there are these tools out there where you can convert from one to the other. But as it says, you very rarely will need to do this because most modern players know that it's, oh, that's a media type and it treats it as though it's one of those. You're always best off when possible saving audio files as MP3s, saving video files as MP4s, or if it's saved as something else, using one of these free converters to convert them to an MP3 or an MP4. All right. Now you are not going to. Some will say, oh, I'll just leave it the way it is, but I just think it's better to do that. How to use them again. With with all of this stuff, there's a lot of different things that you can add. All right. And what they're going to show in here with some of this stuff, it's like if you were going to show a clip from a movie. All right. Or let's you know, let let let's even say it was an audio file and you could put what's called a poster in there so you could have a picture of the host of that. All right. You could have a poster for a video file. So when it came up, it would show maybe the poster that was associated with the movie. Then when you started playing it, of course, it would show the video. So there's also. Notice there's a preload in here. There's an autoplay in here. Most people will tell you like with the autoplay and the loop, etc. You, you don't want to put that kind of stuff in like the autoplay. People don't like it. You know, they want control whether it's an audio file or a video file, they want control and to be able to turn it on and turn it off. All right, but they show some examples in here and all the different stuff that you can put in. All right, accessibility again is a big concern. As it says, if it presents essential con content, you may need to provide a textual version as well. Why? Because that textual version can be shown or read by a screen reader. All right, so they can get basically what's going on in here. Again, as I mentioned before, don't use autoplay. People don't like that typically. So they show a quick little web page in here that's going to show audio and video and with the page layout. So they've got this up on the top here. So when you click here, it's going to show a 21 second long audio clip. And if you click here, all right, and more and more of these today too. I know like with me, if I go out and search for something, there'll be a link down here that if it's on YouTube that you can click there too. All right, so as it says, the web page shown here offers audio and video. The poster is used to display the image in place of a media type right there. All right, and the controls are displayed when the page is loaded. Once the video starts playing, the controls become hidden. All right. It says if you move the cursor off the video, they reappear. So you've got a little bit of control over that. The HTML again, what's new in here? One here is this. Is basically how you set this thing up. All right. And for. Oh, that was it. They didn't even show any CSS, so that was it. So let's do this. It's 903. Let's take till 915 and we'll come back and we'll look at chapter 15 and we'll finish this up talking about CSS transitions, transforms, animations and filters. So take 11 minutes and please come back at 915. I will be right back.
All right, let's start back up. I did find the website I was looking for, and as you can see right there, the problem was I was typing in regular dash expressions dot IO and it was dot info. You don't need that on the end either. All right, so it's regular dash expressions dot info. There are plenty of really good sites out there. I like this one because again, notice there's tutorials. It'll ask what language you're working with. There are examples, etc. I just found this one. This is the one that this is my go to one for lack of better words. You can see there's a quick start. There's a bunch of tutorials, references, etc. But for instance, we're going to go back and look at regular expressions again in JavaScript. So if I go to here and there's JavaScript. So if I want to know more about them, all right. You know, it'll get me started. Now I did look very quickly. Maybe you saw me doing that during the break, and this isn't bad. This regular, it's called regexplanet.com because what you can do is you can choose your language and then you can put in an expression and it'll tell you whether or not it uh, it is valid or it's invalid, okay? But like I said, this is the regular dash expressions.info would be the one that I'd recommend. Okay, so let's finish this up. Now, I, I've said this kind of thing before and I'm going to say it again, and that is transitions, transforms, animations, etc., filters. Use them with care. In other words, it's really easy to take things like animations and uh, overkill with them. In other words, have the animation. Again, you don't want to just use it for the sake of using it. All right, but they give some examples in here, and actually a couple of them are pretty good examples when I went through the uh, uh, through the chapter. A transition, as it says, lets you change one or more properties over a period of time. And there's different ways that you can do this as well. I'm not going to run through that chart. You can take a look at it yourself. But in this example that they're showing right here, what are they doing? Well, they're basically saying for this. What's going to happen is it's going to get bigger and it's going to turn red. Now, that's not a great example. But as you'll see, when you pair that with things like animation, you could also make it move across the screen and there's a lot of other things that you can do with it. All right. And again, when would you use something like that? You know, we we. You might want to do something with red and green to show a success or failure. I don't know, but as an example. So as it says, the transitions typically provide a smooth change from one set of properties to another set of properties. There are other ways of doing this. When we get into where we're talking about JavaScript, we will talk about jQuery. And jQuery basically is a JavaScript library so it's a it's it's a thing that's already been created for you and it has ways to do a lot of these transitions that I think are much cleaner and I think they make a lot more sense. That's why I will tell you again when you take your test, there'll be little to nothing on a hands on test about transitions, transforms, etc. So they have you create this transition here and there's nothing wrong with it. It works fine. So when you click on on this, this shows, and I believe if you click on it again, it goes away type of an idea, it moves up. All right, but again, there are other ways of doing this using actual jQuery. It's kind of funny they show this example, but what is happening today is more and more people, you know, are, are, are it seems like at least, want to be an expert on something, but rather than than being, you know, knowing a, a few things and knowing them well, they want to learn one or two things and learn them fantastically. I was watching a video the other day where the guy came in and uh, I, got, I thought I could show it to you on here, but I guess I can't. Let's see if I go out to here, for example. 
Let's see. All right, when you get this little, you know, the hamburger menu here, he was showing how to create the hamburger menu totally in CSS. And there's nothing wrong with it. All right, but, you know, there are tools that you can use that in many ways, when you just provide a few things to them, they'll do it for you. All right. So you can see it here. There's the transition. Now notice it's. There are a lot of these different you can do. All right. And then it talk. There's talk about curves and there's talk about a few other things. All right. Let me see if I can remember that because we're going to be talking about this soon. Query UI.com. I'm thinking this is the right one. Yeah, we're going to be going over this in a few weeks from jQuery UI.com. And again, this is a library. But if you look in here, now there is an example of an accordion. Well, that should look familiar to you because it looks pretty much like the one we just did. And what they do here, when you click view source, it's sure as heck isn't hard. You have to set up your, your stuff in here as a series of divs, but then to actually run it, guess what? It's a total of about one line. You see, you call accordion, you tell it to accordion. I think that a lot of this stuff is a lot easier than what they show. When we talk about easing, they'll come in here and they will talk about different ways that you can do easing. And you say, well, what the heck is easing? And again, it's how you make you make something fade in, fade out, do transitions, etc. I like going over this stuff better than I like doing it through straight CSS. Not everybody agrees with me. All right. All right. Then next they talk about transforms. And as it says, it allows you to move things around, to kind of rotate, scale, skew them, etc. All right. And this is all the different stuff that you can do. Right. And when we take a look at it in here, they make this gallery. And those are some of the things that you can do. And again, some of that stuff is pretty cool, really. And used in the right circumstance. I mean, it's, it's fantastic to put something like that in there. But to just put something in there to put it in there doesn't make a lot of sense to me. All right. So again, these are eight different transforms that they put in here. Animations, this is probably the one, if I'm gonna use them, I probably would use the most. All right, so it's where it says there, this text will animate, literally not only does it turn red, but it also moves across the screen. Now, what you can do is when you can combine some of the animation stuff with some of the transform stuff that we talked about earlier, maybe you have seen this before where you've got a web page and when you bring it up, something basically fades into view or something, you know, you can. problems with my internet today, but um, it'll have something that will fade into view from the left or from the right or from the top or from the bottom. All right. But again, as I've already said to you, when you are working with this stuff, don't get so enamored with the effects that the person watching it loses what the message is supposed to be. Now, when you work with animation, as it says in here, it points to what's called a keyframe selector that defines the keyframes, and that's what you're defining in here. So you can see we're going from 20% margin left to 60% margin left, and the color is changing from blue to red, etc. All right, now it says for simple animation, the keyframes can be set automatically, but if you're going to do something that's going to be fairly intricate, you can do it yourself. And that's what they show in here. They create a slideshow. All right. So you can make really neat looking stuff in here. All right. Now, what we will talk about is now in here, they, they basically 
create a slideshow and they create a slideshow using CSS. Nothing wrong with that. We will talk about slideshows when we get into the bootstrap part and you'll see that a lot of them are fairly automated. We will talk about slideshows again when we're in the JavaScript part. And again, of course, you have to add a little code, but they'll be fairly automated. All right. And I think they're easier to use than some of this stuff in here is. That's my opinion. All right. So it says the animation works like a jQuery slideshow, but it's done solely with CSS. So what they're doing, for lack of better words, is they're kind of mimicking something that I think is easier to do with software we're going to learn. And that's the reason that, like I said, with a lot of this stuff, with the animation, et cetera, I'm holding off on it. We'll talk about it in more depth and breadth of coverage when we get into uh, the JavaScript portion of the class in a few weeks. The last thing that's discussed in here is filters. All right. And they say, for example, you can convert an image to grayscale or you can blur an image. I know that for a long time, one of the popular things to do was to take a picture and you know a color picture and convert it into black and white. So it had that more old time look to it. As it says, you can use filters to change the appearance of an image in the browser. And when you're doing it, you can use percentages or you can use fractions as well. The last thing that's in this chapter is they come in and as they say, all right, there are they, they apply 10 different filter methods to the same image to show you the effect on each one. All right, and I believe that's it. So I just want to mention a couple things. First off, let's jump into. So for chapter 13, you will have to create a form. All right. And notice that when you click the subscribe button, it just comes back with a message on here. Because again, we're not literally taking it and sending it out to a server someplace. So your specs, there won't be a lot of them. They're shown here. Chapter 14, you'll have to add a little bit of video. I believe that you're given all that stuff. Again, not real much. Chapter 15, as it says, add an embedded font and a story to, you know, or uh, and provide the printing for the story. All right. Now I'm doing that in lieu of, you know, uh, where, you know, 16 is, as it says, it's got this transition and animation. You don't have to do that. You can, but you don't have to. And the last one that's in there is JavaScript, and we're going to look at that one ourselves. All right. As opposed to you having to do that. And with the other one that's assigned, which is, of course, our shape up. Again, we've got a form. You can see it's a more complex form than the other one is. All right. And then we again bring in audio and video. And finally, we add some embedded font and provide some textual information. So you only have to do it through 15, even though 16 is the stuff with a transform, etc. Feel free to do that. I think that's a little goofy what they have here, but if you want to do it, go ahead. And then again, finally, the same kind of thing jumps right into 19. We will do this one as a class. In fact, this I'm going to show you how to write this one in several different ways. All right. So what I'm I'm planning on doing myself. I'm literally running into a problem with my afternoon class and I've, I'm we were writing a an application together and we've got an error that I can't seem to fix, but I'm going to work on that today. All right. But the other thing that I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to come up with some kind of a pretest. All right. And I will have you I, if I can, I'll send it out by tomorrow. Otherwise, it'll be sent out this weekend. Hopefully I will give you Monday to work on the pretest and Tuesday I will go over the pretest. Then Wednesday we will take our next test and Thursday I will go over the remainder of the book. That's the plan right now. If need be, we can change it, but I don't think we'll have to change it at all. I think that that'll work just fine. All right.
Any questions on anything we've gone over today, Grant? No, I think that last section was pretty straightforward. OK, sounds good. All right, then lab for the rest of the day today and lab tomorrow, and I will talk to all of you next week. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too.